here today, to those regular and to those visiting. Who do I see here? Brian. Excellent to see you again after a few months away. And to Callum. Um, is Rebecca here today? Well, not yet. Not yet. Oh. <laughs> She's excused. Great to see everyone here today. Um, so do you notice anything different today? Yes. yes. What, the jacket? No. no. This the the earpiece. Yes, a new headset which we endeavoured to procure this week uh, and we also have a new tech desk so please have a look on the way out and admire the, the skill of the craftsman it's kind of been revamped by Jack and by John uh, setting up the whole system again and the sound system is much more efficient and, was, and there'll be some of you who'll be saying thank goodness for that <laughs> <laughs> well you didn't have to laugh so hard <laughs> So we've done the best we could, and in fact, if I turn the volumes down, it's, it's so effective, but we're really pleased about that. But, you know, the, the guy at the back has the option of turning this mic down if I do go on a bit, too, go on too long, which I don't usually do, normally. <laughs> now on Thursday, another innovation, we had the mobile TV through uh, next door, and we cast a video from it. It went well, but at times it was difficult for people to, to hear partly because the, the accent was very, very strong. And also we were um, following a written script which jumped. So to bring it all together, we'll have the meeting in here from now on. So no one will be able to say, I didn't hear a word he said tonight. <laughs> so that includes yourself. So we'll bring the TV in here. We'll use the, this microphone for leading. And there's the new handset uh, microphone which is totally effective. So when it comes to your time for prayer, we will use the handset so everybody will pray. So that's okay. Does that meet with everyone's approval? Yes. Yes. We, we want everyone to hear everyone else's prayer. So on Thursday, we'll just meet here and uh, play with the organ. It's a wonderful time of worship. So that's all. The, these are all the notices. I think John's put up some other notices which may be of interest to you. So we're here to worship the Lord. Great to see you all. Rebecca is here, so thank you. We can start the meeting. <laughs> Good to see you again. So, welcome to Carlyle Church, everyone here and those watching online. We're very glad you've joined with us for this hour of worship, and may you find it edifying and a blessing to your soul. So let's begin with the uplifting hymn, Rejoice, the Lord is King. <coughs>
Well, let's come before the Lord in prayer together. Let's still our hearts. In corporate prayer. Lord our God, we draw near to you this day to seek your face and your blessing for our lives, for our families, our neighbours and our land. We also pray with compassion for the nations and peoples of the earth for whom this day will be another day of suffering, of war and displacement from their homes and lands. In the midst of their misery will you reach out to your heart and hand of mercy, that they might know your nearness and grace in times of peril and oppression. We join with the worldwide church to seek your intervention in the areas of conflict, war and famine. So many suffering and all we can do is ask that you would look down upon them with heaven's heart and make yourself known to them, for you are the answer to mankind's needs. So may thy kingdom come across the world, and may your church rise up to play its significant part in showing kindness and practical care to those who need it the most, the estranged, the widows and orphans, all of whom we are called to intercede for. For our land and island we pray, for new beginnings and fresh hope for all peoples, that we might see the beauty of living together in peace and harmony with our neighbours, of all nationalities and backgrounds. May we be open-hearted to all, for the commandment is to love our neighbour as ourselves, no matter who they are. For those we have hurt and offended, even spoken ill of, we repent and confess our wrong ways and ask your forgiveness. We pray for those who rule over us nationally and locally that they would be inspired to take note of your word and desire that rulers should rule with compassion and even-handedness, not with bias and prejudice. Remove from us those who persist in division, argument and strife, those who perpetuate bigotry and rivalry. And Lord, let it not be found in your church. Cleanse us in our churches from worldliness and shallow spirituality and let us once again be inspired by the Spirit of God to be a zealous, holy people set apart by God to do good works in your name. Bless this congregation with healthy growth and steadfast loyalty to Christ and his cause to faithfully proclaim the gospel by which all may be saved. So to that end, together we unite our hearts and our voices as we speak the words taught us by the Lord Jesus himself. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, thy will be done, us Some of you will know that this is one of these special days for the lady to my left who sings and the organ so beautifully plays. We may speculate as to how old she is, but I'm giving nothing away. It's not the done thing to mention, not the right thing to say. So all we will do is honour her qualities, character and charm, a lady of excellence and many gifts, with a list as long as you are. A woman of wise counsel, and such she's proved to be, throughout the years of marriage to her beloved Kenny. A couple who walk together in Christian faith and unity. Their witness has been a shining light, a living testimony. They've served this church and elsewhere with devotion and integrity, the most desirable fruit of the Spirit for all of us to see. So, Mrs. Patterson, sorry for embarrassing. So, Mrs. Patterson, we give thanks that you've been spared for these many years as you reflect on your journey of life. You may even shed one or two tears. May you have great joy as with your family you celebrate this special birthday year, which begins with the number eight. Oops, sorry, I've given it away. <laughs> Happy special birthday. Let's give her a round of applause. Oh, well, 
Well, the Lord has crowned your ears with blessedness and with great gifts. And so we're going to sing now about another head that has been crowned, the head that once was crowned with thorns. So have you ready to play, Margaret? Have you we got your card? <laughs> so I can read it at a proper distance, but we'll do the best we can. So Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 to 13. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified, What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels, you crowned him with glory and honour, and put everything under his feet. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet, at present, we do not see everything subject to him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honour, because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers. In the presence of the congregation, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I, 
and the children God has given me. Amen. May God bless his word to us this morning. And before we turn to it, we'll sing a, a hymn which declares that Christ is Lord, Jesus is Lord, number 376. It's time to sing. of Jesus, where once his head was crowned with thorns, and he despised and rejected by so many, and then contrast that with the exalted risen king that we, we acclaimed with our opening hymn. It's the contrast of his, his position in life, and the scripture kind of defines it, or this is from a, from a hymn, humbled for a season to receive a name from the lips of sinners unto whom he came. He was humbled throughout his life. This was the lowly, lowly Jesus that the scriptures speak of. We see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels, but now crowned with glory and honor. Why? Because he suffered death. That's why he's crowned with glory. And we see in this pattern of humbling and raising up, a pattern ordained by God, not just for Jesus, but for all his followers, I believe, throughout time. There's an element of that that will come into our lives. For we don't come into the kingdom of God. We don't come in as believers in uh, all proud and self-confident, exuding our own independence and self-assurance. Far from it. We must come in humbly. We must come in bending our knee, our heart, and in contrite spirit and heart attitude to become believers. For we know that it's the way that God desires people. God opposes the proud, the people who will not bend any, the people who are stubborn and resistant in their heart, 
who will not humble themselves under the mighty hand of God, that in due season he will raise them up. The self-righteous and the self-assured person will always say, I don't need to humble myself. I'm fine as I am. And remember Lord Campbell a couple of weeks ago, that was, that's what he would say when people would challenge him in his earlier years as to becoming Christian. He said, I'm fine as I am. And in his own eyes he was. He said, why do I need to repent and change himself? He was and, you know, I'm as good as anyone. And in, a, in many respects that is true. While we evaluate people in our society as to who they are, their prominence or their, or their role in society, their value, their valued citizenship, uh, all that they can accomplish, we would say, well, that person deserves merit and acclaim and a position, and rightly so, and we never detract from what their achievements have been. But in, as God weighs it up, it weighs nothing on the scales of his balance as to what is being right with God. We may have all the virtues and done all the good works in our life, but when it comes to justifying ourselves before God, there's one thing that must be present, and that is faith. Faith must be not, Lord, I've been a good guy all my life. I have given to the poor. I've given to mission work. Surely I am a good person in your sight. And God says, no, you haven't humbled yourself. You've seen your good works and presented them to me as, as a means of merit. And it, God will say they're good in themselves, but they will never err. You must... Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith in Christ is the, is the essential part. No matter who we are in life, we all come into that humbling of ourselves. It's harder for a rich man to pass through the eye of a needle than for many to come into the kingdom of God. They must humble themselves, lower themselves, as they did with that camel. It was a very, very narrow gate that only a camel on its knees with, with, a, with someone on top could get into. And so that's the basic requirement for entry into the kingdom of God as a Christian. We come humbly. We don't come justifying, Lord, all that we've done. And in that attitude, God justifies us. We are sent from justified by God. And we have that ringing in our ears that God has approved us based on what I've put value in is what God has put the supreme value in. And that's the sacrifice of Christ. He, he, was glo he is glorified because he tasted death for you and I. And so we, when we honour that, we honour the highest element in the world that God has given for us to find our righteousness and peace with God. That's, that's what, we, what the world so much needs us in our prayer. The world is in strife. You, the world and nations and peoples are in strife. And there are many who do not seek peace. There are those who do. We pray earnestly for peace to come. But the Bible portrays a picture of a world turbulent, throughout all the nations, throughout all history, that man will strive with man, and nation against nation, all for supremacy and for power, all because instead of yielding to one another, it's wars, wars break out over boundaries, lines of nations, and what, what lands belong to so and so. So the human heart needs always to be humbled, in a sense, to live a righteous life. And that's the same way that we don't just come into the kingdom humbly, but we are to walk that way for the rest of our lives. And that again is a discipline for us to, to subdue the flesh. The flesh would want to exalt me. Haven't I done well? Haven't I good? Haven't I really, you know, there's that element in us all and we see it for what it is. And we're not to puff ourselves up. It's lovely when we get encouragement from others and say, well, you did well there, that's fine. I take it on board, but I give thanks to God who has enabled me to do these things. So humility is a grace. I think I mentioned that in the poem. Humility is a grace. It's not just a natural quality. We have to, uh, I believe, um, yield in our hearts to be the humble one, to be the humble personality in a group of people who are full of gossip and chat and worldliness, and we become the humble one who's not going to enter into that way, divisive way of the world where we speak ill of others. We will keep our, our mouths shut. We will speak, if we have anything to say, we'll only speak that which is good. Because God is watching over everything that we do as his people every day. And, you know, it, it, it's a, it is a, a solemn thing and that we should never forget that we can never hide from God, from the scrutiny of his his words, our actions at work, whatever that might be, in a, in a little office or far away and somewhere else, is seen by God. 
And that's why we do confess of, of sins and our prayers every Sunday, not lightly, not glibly, because we have very lightly sinned in thought, word, and deed this week. And so we sing, God, forgive me. It was wrong of me to do that. So humility is a fruit that's cultivated. And it's a beautiful thing to see in other people too. You know that someone has earned merit or standing and it's, their, it's almost their right to, to say it, but they don't. They defer themselves. They put themselves down. And I'm not wishing to, to single anyone out today, but the person we spoke of earlier on is such a person who never wants to have any focus on herself, serving God faithfully in this church and elsewhere. And that is a beautiful dignity that we, you know, we all learn from and admire in others. And so I hope we see qualities in one another, say, I love your patience. I wish I had more of your patience. I wish I had more of your listening ear. I tend to jump in. So we all have qualities. And when we look at one another, we see, you know, I, I love his heart, the way he thinks of, you know, the poor in our community, or he's, he's willing to get up and to do it. These are qualities which inspire us and to live the Christian way. And we need one another to, to see these qualities to be inspired. So by grace we are saved through faith. And again, this is the gift of God. It's not something that we bear. Give. Faith is a gift. And as a gift, I, I believe we have to ask for it. We have to ask for that gift of faith. It can't come from our conscious will or desire. I want to believe. Some people want to believe, but there's a gap between coming to full belief. And that gap is faith. Faith comes, faith, without faith it's impossible to please God. So to come into the promises of God, we must exercise faith in his words. And many people hear the word, like here on Sunday, but maybe they're not mixing it with faith. There's something missing. They're hearing the words, but their hearts aren't taking it in by faith. And when that word comes in, it produces life and faith in you. And so ask for faith. And we can have that battle within us. I have a measure of faith and I have a measure of doubt. Warring within each person. Like the man who came to Jesus and his son was, was in, in deep trouble physically with an epilepsy. I can't remember what it was exactly. And he said, Lord have mercy upon him. And Jesus said, do you believe I can? And he said, I, I believe but help my unbelief. See there's a part in us all I think that's for the rest of our lives, yes, we believe that Jesus is Lord, but there's a part of us too that wars and doubt, that struggles with some of the things that we ought to believe. And for someone who's not quite a Christian yet, I believe so much, but there's a part of me that doesn't fully believe. And by preaching the word, you know, Sunday after Sunday, we're trying to make everybody minimize that gap so that they come to a true faith, so that they can say, I believe. I believe on all the promises of God. I believe in his words. And we don't want to be kind of an in-between place of, well, I, I have, but I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm in I'm, or I'm out. And it's a very unpleasant place to be. And I was reminded of a silly rhyme from way back. And when they were up, they were up. And when they were down, they were down. When they were only halfway up, they were neither up or down. Yeah, yeah. It's a place, when you're halfway up, you're neither one or the other. You're not on the way up, well, you're stopped, you've come a long way, but you need to carry on, you need to see that, well, do you want to go back? Well, who wants to go back? Some people do, unfortunately. They see, no, the, the climb is too much for me. But we're, we're these people who, we're halfway up, or wherever, we see, Lord, I want to keep on going with you, right to the summit. Wherever that summit leads, it leads to the place of glory to be with you. And it's, I'm sure there's a, there's a measure of that in us all. So we want to, at every stage in our Christian life, to say, come on, let's, let's aspire, let's press on, as Paul said. Take hold of that for which Christ laid, laid hold of you. When you became a Christian, when you came to faith, something came into you of the journey of faith that lies ahead. And the many are the issues that come to, ah, to put us off, to get us weary, disillusioned in our, in our faith. But we've got to press on through the emotions, through the, the mindset, through all the difficulties that we face personally, intellectually, whatever, to lay hold of what Christ has laid hold of you for. And that is the eternal salvation of our soul. That is to walk with Christ and to be with him in eternity. And so we don't want to quit halfway up or be, go back halfway down. And we find some of these characters in Pilgrim's Progress. 
If you've read the book, there's so many different characters, and Christian is the man who sets out on a journey to the, to the celestial city, which is we're seeking the, the, the road, the Christian road to glory. And all along the way, he meets different people. Some come along with him from the journey, and one of them is called Pliable. You can imagine what kind of character Pliable is, you know? He go, and he was a neighbor of Christians who said, oh, I'm coming with you. We're going to go up that golden path, and we're going to go to glory. But, you know, somewhere along the, the, the road, he fell into the slough of despond. Something happened to really discourage him, and he fell into this slough of despond from which he did not arise. He said, no, it's too much for me. So he went back. He went back. Contrast that with another pilgrim who joined him on a journey, faithful. So you can imagine it immediately. Faithful was a man like Pliable who set out on a journey to go the whole way. And he, accompli he accompanies Christian the whole way until it comes to the place where he faces death because he, he encounters a community where there's Satan worshipping going on and he publicly rebukes it and ridicules it. And so, you know, he, he is put to death for his crime of pointing out sinfulness in mankind. But he was willing to put his hand to the plough. He didn't say, oh, it's getting tough here. I'm going to turn back. I'm under threat. No. And that's, you know, that's the spirit of martyrdom that we found in the early church. Christians were committed to following Christ, even unto death. And unto death it was for many. And although we, and I trust that we will never have to face the penalty of death, that ought to be the attitude of our heart. Lord, if it was so called that you ask me to stand unto, for your name, and even unto death, let me have the grace and the courage to do it. It's hypothetical, but in our hearts we want to have made that journey. We want to have preempted what may come and say, Lord, I'm willing to go all the way. Because we've got to see the value of what we would gain or lose. And if we keep our own soul and our own comfort, then we've lost the eternal. But if we see my life, let it lie in the grave for the eternal glory that lies ahead. And so only spiritual eyes will help you and I to make the right decision. I'm going for glory, I'm going for the spiritual, for eternity. So nothing uh, will come or should come uh, on our journey to keep us back, but many things do. And I was reminded of a, a, a pastor from Peter Heed. As he spoke in a very broad, you know, local dialect and he had so many catchy phrases and I used to enjoy going to his meetings and one of the phrases he had was, uh, there are more starters than stickers. There are more f starters than stickers. Can you guess what that? You know, man said, yeah, I'm starting on the road with you. I'm going on the way. But you know, along came doubt, along came disillusion, along came whatever. You say, I'm not sticking this. I'm, I'm going. So we want to be a people who begin the race, who walk the race with Jesus, who stick it all the way through, no matter what, whether we are publicly shamed, whether we feel marginalized or ridiculed, we are going to go all the way. The Savior leads me. For we are not, I trust, a people who will ever turn back. It will be to our shame to do so. Yet, we, and I must be honest about this, disillusionment comes to us all. If I were to ask you to raise a hand, anyone here who is never disillusioned, I would be shocked if anyone. We all have periods, whether it be moments, hours or longer, of disillusionment, of life, yes, and even of our own journey as Christians. I, I, I must say that is very true. Think of it yourself. Have you been disillusioned? Well, think of the disciples. They made their absolute commitment to follow Jesus. Master, wherever you go, we will go. And so it was all the days of his ministry. When it, but it, when it came to the, the crunch when Jesus was arrested and taken on trial, many of his disciples fled. Fled the scene because it was really, they were in a sense on trial as well. And one of the, the points that arose from the video we watched on Thursday was, that this is Caiaphas the high priest giving uh, an account of Jesus and of the trial and of the reasons why he as the, he the high priest who represented the Jewish faith decided that Jesus should be put to death. Uh, it's, it's intriguing. There's something you won't have heard before, so it's just an invitation to come and to be part of it. But he records that throughout the time of his leadership, there was, there was never such a tumult in Jerusalem 
as at the trial and at the crucifixion of Jesus. It was estimated that hundreds of thousands were gathered in Jerusalem. Now you imagine the walled city containing hundreds of would hardly be a space to breathe, to move. But they had come. We're, we weren't fully aware of how much uproar Jesus had caused through Israel, but he had caused huge uproar. In fact, Caiaphas and also a, a, another Roman leader said it was the greatest test of all his leadership was the trial of Jesus because his nation was on the brink of civil war. It was so, it had so engulfed the minds and captivated people that they were, they were torn. There were many people, now this is not recorded in the Gospels, but there were many people who were there who were saying, take him down from the cross, he doesn't, he doesn't deserve to be there. People who supported them, whose words are not recorded here, but they're recorded there. They were, the crowd were divided. They weren't all baying for his death, crucified somewhere, but there were many. So he was, in, he was caught in, in the midst of this. And he, he really wanted to handle it correctly, and so he decided upon the death. And on Thursday night, we will start off on some part of, of the video with the, the, the reasons that Caiaphas gave. He gave a list of reasons why I now am going to pass the sentence that he should be passed on to the Romans for crucifixion. So it, it makes a very interesting reading. But you see, in the midst of all that, when it got really tough, some of the disciples said, this is too much for me to handle, and they ran away. Now, I'm not saying they abandoned the Lord in their heart, but they physically couldn't stand the pressure of being associated with, because some of the crowd might want to crucify them too. So this, I would say, was a dark night of their soul. They would have been away, gone away so, so ashamed, so embarrassed that they had, you know, let the, let the master down. Master, we'll stay with you wherever we go except this one occasion. We got, we, so one can imagine that they were downhearted. Some of them broke, broken hearted. But then after the resurrection, what happens? Jesus appears in the room. Suddenly, without any door opening, Jesus stands in the room and says, peace be with you. And breathed upon them the Spirit of God and see my hands and he reassured them and they felt the joy of being back with the Master. So from the depths of disillusionment and despair, they were lifted to the heights of joy again. And such can be in our Christian life. We can have the heights and we can have the depths. And when we're in the depths, it's hard to see the heights. And when you're on the, up on the mountain tops, it's hard to imagine that you're gonna go through a time in the valley of sorrow or grief or loneliness or whatever, but it can happen like that. And so when we're up, we need to know that we could come down and how to prepare ourselves lest we fall into the slough of despond. We may pass through the slough of despond, but come out of it and shake it off. Shake off the, the muck and the smell from it and come out into a time of, of freedom. And after this, you know, the, the weeping for a night may endure, but joy does come in the morning. That's the biblical injunction when we go through the valley of sorrow and weeping and mourning and lostness and sense. Then suddenly there's a change in the atmosphere, a change in our heart and the weeping and the sorrow is, is less and less and we're beginning to find a new joy again. There's, there's new shoots like in springtime, new shoots of hope again in my heart. I can live again. I can face the future. I can see things that I can do because joy has come to my heart. We cannot remain in mourning forever. We cannot remain in sadness. We can, but we don't want to let it. We want God to take, take our hand the hand of the man of Galilee, and lift us out. And so the disciples, after this time of disillusionment, some of them went back briefly to their former occupations, such as fishing, and we find Jesus meets them on the shore, and they're out casting their nets. And once they had spent time with the risen Lord, their vision was reignited again. They weren't going to go back to a life of fishing, okay, it produced it, uh, livelihood for their family, but they saw something greater. They saw again the call of God, which was way back three years ago, leave these, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And so, see, that, that calling upon the life had just probably been dropped. While it's over, it's gone. Morning, but Jesus said, now go. Go and make disciples again. And so we see them leaving their homes, leaving their occupations. And so they went out. They had a, a greater cause, and they didn't say, well, Lord, how are we going to manage 
to, to feed our families. Go, and as you go, the Lord will provide for you and your family. And so the rest is history. They went from Jerusalem, Judea, to all the ends of the earth, preaching the gospel, and God provided for them. So again, let me reiterate and identify personally with the fact that we can become weary pilgrims. Ministers can become weary pilgrims. I want you to know that. You probably know that. Then. Ministers be can become very weary, disillusioned, dispirited people. Most of us, most of you live your faith privately, quietly, you get on with it, you just do it. But ministers who stand in churches week by week, in a sense, have their hearts open to everyone. And people see where they're at. Sometimes they see good things, sometimes they see shallow things. And so it's very humbling, I've got to tell you, for ministers to stand up before a, an audience who are listening, who are watching, who are observing and who are making assessments about that person's heart and life. And it is, it is, a, it is a difficult experience at times. And a minister can become seriously disillusioned both in himself, not in his Christian faith, but can become, become so disillusioned with the effectiveness of his ministry. Because he is looking for fruit, for growth, for advance, for progression in the kingdom. And when he sees little of that, if any, then he says, I have failed, Master. I have brought nothing. And you can understand that he goes home, he being just someone else, but he being the minister who sees, Lord, what have I done? No fish in the net, no growth in the church, no great zeal for prayer, no great attendance in church, all these things that diminish the faith and the zeal of the minister. But if, what's he going to do? Go home and wallow in it for the rest of the day of the week? Oh, no, he mustn't. He mustn't. Because he has a duty to get out of that slough, despond, get up on his feet, break through all the barriers of faith and unbelief that come to him and say, Master, I must arise and go to a church again and say, that's my testimony this morning. My, my living testimony from this morning, from 6.30 in this morning, till I came in here in church. It is not easy to do what we're doing. It is very hard, but we're doing it because the master, and I'm not doing it to win any sort of, oh, there, there, so not at all, but just to honestly share with you how you'll have your areas of disillusionment too in life, whether it's your family or whatever, in work. But we all go through them. But we're here for one another to help us through. When Jesus, for example, the two on the road to Emmaus, they were totally disillusioned. They were totally, wow, we've lost it all, all our hopes. They were walking home depressed. And until the Lord Jesus came alongside them and shared time with them and spoke to them, came into their homes. And he, he spent time. And we need that too. We need a time when you're down and, and feeling disillusioned. We can turn to... The Lord himself, of course, we turn to the Lord Jesus, please help my heart, Lord, it's hurting. And this. But we can also turn to one another. And this is why I really, really encourage us, you, to be an encouraging people to one another. When you see someone maybe feeling a little lower down, go alongside them and just say, are you okay? Can I, would you like to share something? Can I pray with you? We're not that people. But I tell you, there's nothing more miserable than going to church, going home lonely, feeling uncared for, feeling no one really knows my burden. We don't want to blurt everything out. But we, if we are a family, which we ought to be, we come alongside and say, are you okay today? I just felt that you were a wee bit downhearted. Anything you want to share with me? That's the kind of people we ought to be, caring for one another and, and, and really meaning, in a meaningful way. And all that helps us on our journey in life. I know very little of what any of you are going through. Some of it I do more than others. But there will be seasons where you're dispirited about your faith, your family, your church, whatever. And by being honest like this, we will say, let's all pull together. Let's all pull. As I pray for you, for the church to come on, to grow, please pray for the leadership to be, to be inspired by God, not to lose heart, not to be one of those who's pliable and who says, Master, it's too much for me. No, but just to 
come alongside one another and be the body of Christ, the family of God, supporting one another. And I think then together, we're all as pilgrims, making progress, some slowly, some greatly. But if we do that, pulling together like that, as a church, then we will all, we will all walk on that narrow path that leads to glory where Jesus is waiting for us. I began by looking at Jesus being humbled for a season. And you know, friends, there's nothing wrong in admitting to somebody that you are really having a hard time. We all have the, I'm not saying it's a veneer, but you shake hands at the door and most churches have you, I'm fine, thank you, fine. 70 fines and maybe one get up. One, well, I'm, seven, are 70 people all fine? No. Now we're not leading, we're not looking for a 10 minute list of all the awards, but you know, just find someone to be your friend, to be your prayer friend and say, look, I'm, I'm struggling with something. I want to share this with you in confidence. It's not to be blurted out, but please, you know, just pray for me at home. I need your help. And that means that the ministry is coming from you to one another, body ministry. So we, I would love us all to be like that. And when we humble ourselves up personally and as a church, God will raise us up. He will lift us up from the mire and from our gloom and darkness. And so we want to finish by asking God to lift our heads and open wide the gates of this church once again, that a spirit of encouragement would come upon every heart, that no one here or watching would be disillusioned with their Christian life or with their walk, but determined today, hey, I'm having a tough time, but I'm going to carry on. So let's pray together before we sing. Dear Lord, we still ourselves before you at the end of this service, thanking you for one another. Thank you for the treasure that each and every person here is. You've shaped and formed us. You've made us who we are. And at times, Lord, we need someone to lean on. And we need it. There's times when we need to embrace someone and encourage them. And I ask, Lord, that through the word and the worship today, we have all been encouraged in some measure to be faithful followers of Christ, never to give up, but to keep pressing on, to see something better and good lying ahead. Because the Lord who is our shepherd goes before us to lead us again into fresh pastures, refreshing waters. The days of, of our grieving and what's gone behind may be over. It's time to grasp a new day of God's refreshing. So bless all here, Lord, today and who are watching. May there be none who will remain in the valley of sorrow or the valley of disillusionment after this morning's service. May they pick themselves up, bow the knee and ask for your help. For we ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. So ye gates, lift up your heads on high. Psalm 24, verse 7 to 10.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you this day. Amen. Amen. Amen.